One way of conceptualizing yourself is that you're one speck of dust among seven billion. And when you conceptualize yourself that way, you might think, well, what difference does it make what I say or do? And that's actually quite convenient for you, because if it doesn't matter what you say or do, then you don't have any responsibility and you can do whatever you want. The price you pay for that is a bit of nihilism, but if you don't have to shoulder any responsibility, that's a small price to pay. Another, that's the underground motivation for nihilism. But the other way of looking at it, and this is actually the accurate way of looking at it, is that you're in a network. You're a node in a network, and so you can do a little bit of arithmetic very rapidly and just figure out how powerful you are. You know a thousand people. You're going to know more than that over the course of your life, but let's say a thousand for the sake of argument for now. They know a thousand people. That means that you're one person away from a million people and two persons away from a billion people. And you're the center of that network. And now the way networks work is that information propagates in a network manner. So don't underestimate the power of your speech. Now, you know, Western culture is fell logocentric. Let's say it. Okay, so we'll say, yeah, that's just fine. That's exactly what it is. It's predicated on the idea of the logos, that the logos is the sacred element of Western culture. And what does that mean? It means that your capacity for speech is divine. It's the thing that generates order from chaos and then sometimes turns pathological order into chaos when it has to. Don't underestimate the power of truth. There's nothing more powerful. Now, in order to speak what you might regard as the truth, you have to let go of the outcome. You have to think, all right, I'm going to say what I think, stupid as I am, biased as I am, ignorant as I am. I'm going to state what I think as clearly as I can, and I'm going to live with the consequences no matter what they are. Now, the reason you think that, that's an element of faith. The idea is that nothing brings a better world into being than the stated truth. Now, you might have to pay a price for that, but that's fine. You're going to pay a price for every bloody thing you do and everything you don't do. You don't get to choose to not pay a price. You get to choose which poison you're going to take. That's it. So if you're going to stand up for something, stand up for your truth. It'll, it'll shape you because people will respond and object and tell you why you're a fool and a biased moron and why you're ignorant. And then if you listen to them, you'll be just that le much less like that the next time you say something. And if you do that for five years, you'll be so damn tough and articulate and able to communicate and withstand pressure that you won't even recognize yourself. And then you'll be a force to contend with. It's almost impossible to provide people with enough protection so that they feel safe to speak. Okay, so we'll address that directly. It is not safe to speak, and it never will be. But the, uh, the thing you've got to keep in mind is that it's even less safe not to speak. Right? It's a balance of risks. It's like you want to you wanna pay the price for being who you are and stating your mode of being in the world, or do you want to pay the price for being a bloody serf, a one that's enslaved him or herself? Well, that's a major price, man. That thing unfolds over decades, and you'll just be a miserable worm at the end of about 20 years of that, right? No self-respect, no power, no ability to voice your opinions, nothing left but resentment because everyone's against you, because of course you've never st stood up for yourself. It's like, say what you think carefully, pay attention to your words. The price is, it's a price you want to pay if you are willing to believe that truth is the cornerstone of society and in, in the most real sense if you're if you if you're willing to take that leap then tell the truth and see what happens and nothing better could possibly happen to you there'll be ups and downs and there'll be pushback and there'll be controversy and all of that but it doesn't matter the truth is what makes the world the truth is what redeems the world from hell and that's the truth and we saw plenty of hell over the last hundred years you know and we haven't learned a bloody thing from it it's like, wake up, tell the truth, tell the truth, or at least don't lie if that's a start. You should concentrate on who you should become, especially if you're young. And so let's say you're miserable and nihilistic and chaotic and depressed and all of that now, and you have your reasons, you know, terrible parenting, abuse, all of those things. It's like, well, you should feel good about yourself. It's like, no, no, it's, it's, not, it's not the right message, is that it's more like you should understand how much potential there is within you to set that straight 
and then you should do everything you can to manifest that in the world and it will set it straight and that's better than self-esteem it's like you're you're in a crooked horrible position okay fine there's a lot of suffering and pain associated with that yeah you can't just feel good about that because it's not good but you can do something about it you can genuinely do something about it and I think all the evidence suggests that that's the case yes so I'm telling telling young people look there's no matter how bad your situation is I'm not gonna pretend it's okay it's not okay it's tragic tainted with malevolence and some people really get hurt by malevolent people like you know terribly hurt sometimes they never recover it's really awful but there's more to you than you think and if you stand up and face it with with a positive with a with a noble vision with discipline and intent you can go far farther to overcoming it than you can imagine and that's the principle upon which you should predicate your behavior and I think that one of the things that's really nice about being a clinical psychologist is that this isn't just guesswork like one of the things we know two things in clinical psychology one is truthful conversations redeem people because if you come to a clinical psychologist whose worth is salt you have a truthful conversation the conversation is well, here's what's wrong with my life and here's what caused it you know maybe it takes a year to have that conversation and both of the participants are doing everything they can to lay it out properly here's how it might be fixed here's what a, a beneficial future might look like and so it's a completely honest conversation if it's working well and all that's happening in the conversation is that the two people involved are trying to make things better that's the goal let's see if we can have a conversation that will make things better Okay, so we know that works. It does make things better. And then another thing we know is that, well, let's say there's a bunch of things that you're afraid of that are in your way. So you have some vision about who you want to be. Maybe you have to, you know, you want to be successful in your career, so you have to learn to talk in front of a group. It's like, okay, well, you're afraid of that. It's like, no wonder you don't want to be humiliated. So, okay, so what do we do about that? Well, maybe we first get you to speak in front of one person and then three people, you know, for five minutes and then for ten minutes. Like graduated exposure to what you're afraid of voluntary graduated exposure to what you're afraid of is curative and that's true it works the documentation is in it's how people learn so so to 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 tell people that if you confront the world forthrightly if you speak the truth and you expose yourself courageously to those things that you're afraid of that your life will improve and so will the life of people around you like as far as I'm concerned that's as close to undeniable fact as we as we've got and it also dovetails nicely with the underlying archetypal stories the heroic stories it's like go out there find the dragon confront it it's a dragon it might eat you it's dangerous but it's worse to cower at home and wait for it to come and devour you go out there confront it get the gold share it with the community it's like yeah, it's the oldest story of mankind. Well, there isn't any difference between the fool and someone who's courageous, right, from an archetypal perspective. And, I mean, Abraham is a fool, obviously, when he starts his, his, his adventures. I mean, the story lays it out in that manner. He's far too old to be leaving home, for example. He's a late bloomer. You know, and, and then he has, he has a lot of catastrophic adventures along the way. And certainly you could imagine that had you encountered him when he first encountered the famine in the land of strangers when he first went out, that the idea that he had, uh, he had followed his misguided intuitions would have been self-evident. But in the Abrahamic stories, there is this call to get out and do. And, and that's it. And the thing is, is that, you know, one of the things I've learned put it to make it concretely is that like I've done a lot of different things in my life and every time I did a new thing I was a fool I did it badly I, I was an imposter right and 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 because uh, when you first start to do something you don't know what you're doing but that that's okay that's an acceptance of your vulnerability right and your ignorance that's humility in some sense the willingness to be a fool in a new in the land of strangers that's it the willingness to be a fool in the land of strangers and that's an act of courage because you also reveal your vulnerability to the world by stumbling around. But as long as you're stumbling forward, then you're going to move forward. Now, how do you do that more concretely? You aim at an ideal, right? And you aim at an ideal that's beyond you. Now, maybe you don't aim to begin with at an idea that ideal that's so beyond you that you're crushed by its magnificence, you know? Maybe that's, that's, that's too demotivating to move you. But you could at least conceptualize yourself as the you that you are with fewer of the faults that you know of. 
And that's a good start. And I also think that's associated with the idea of humility. Take stock. Figure out how it is that you're not who you could be. And then move in that direction. And accept the consequences. You know, you're, you're going to get slapped a lot. But maybe with each slap, you'll straighten up a little bit. Especially if you listen, even to the people who are slapping you. Because sometimes they're the ones who can reveal for you very quickly where it is that you're weak and insufficient so that you won't have to be that way in the future. If you're reasonably articulate, like start talking and sharpen yourself up. I mean, the enemy is, is a cloud. They're a cloud of gnats. They're only courageous in groups. They're only courageous in mobs. If you stand your ground and don't apologize and articulate things properly, they'll disperse around you like they're not even there. So most of it's illusion. So don't be, be afraid, but be afraid of the right thing. And the right thing you should be afraid of is not saying what you say, because that's the same as not being. And here you are, suffering in a way. You might as well be at the same time. At least then there's something to you.
tâm di chuyển đường thế mà lại nằm tương tương